Welcome to another edition of Understanding the Times. Now the Bible says in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, the sons of Issachar understood the times and they knew what the children of Israel should be doing. I believe that's so apropos for us today. We need to know what's really going on. What's in the atmosphere? What kind of things are dominating our culture? The way we think, the way we live, how we function as a people, and how does the Word of God fit in that framework? And oftentimes, we're so sociological, we lose our theological perspective. Our sociology must bow its knee to our theology. Meaning, how we think critically from a biblical perspective should dictate how we respond to things in the social structures of our culture. Unfortunately, we've become more adapted to the culture rather than presenting the high standard for the culture. We've kind of meshed in. So how does God see that? Should we be adapting to how people in the world think? Should we bow to Babylonian systems and allow them to form and frame our outlook? The scriptures are real clear as to how we should be thinking. There's one passage that really sticks out to me. I think that has tremendous implications. And tonight we're going to be talking about the radical remnant. In other words, there's a remnant of God's people. There's a small segment. It's not the entire body of Christ. Not everybody's ready for this. However, this remnant carries a deep conviction, a holy zeal, a passion for the things of God, and they will not bow to any other systems in this world. Nothing and no one has their hand on the head of the holy remnant, the radical remnant, but God himself. Himself. And the Bible is real clear in Isaiah chapter 28, a powerful passage. It talks about in that day, and it's referring to a specific time, the Lord of hosts. Whenever you see the term in the Bible, Lord of hosts, it's always referring to the Lord of war. Why is that important? Hey, folks, we're in a war. And the war that we're in is not with flesh and blood. We're dealing with principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in the high places. Uh, through that comes uh, a war of ideas, perspectives, ways of thinking. And our culture is inundated with all kinds of ideas and ways of thinking. And the church has got to rise up in spiritual warfare. So it says in that day, the Lord of hosts uh, will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty. A crown denotes royalty, kingdom of authority and a diadem of beauty the hebrew word there for diadem is the word tesephora. It means a rotating crown, a crown that turns based on what's being dealt with. It denotes really a changing of the guard. And we're coming into a season now like never before of a changing of the guard. We've been in this pandemic for the last several months and things just kind of shut down in March. And I believe even though God didn't cause that, I believe sincerely that the hand of God was in the middle of it because to some extent, I believe God was shutting down this thing we call church. What we were doing, how we were going, the way we were functioning had nothing to do with the kingdom. It was more about buildings and budgets and bishops and apostles and pastors and our church choir and our church doing our programs. And it wasn't designed around one person. His name is Jesus. Everything we do must be centered around the person of Christ. So when we get away from that, uh, we have a form of godliness, the Bible says, but deny the power thereof. So to some extent, um, that's where we were. I should say to a large extent, that's where we were. So now God is recalibrating the church, reframing us with a time of reformation. Actually, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 6 talks about the time of reformation, verses 6 through 10. And that's where we are right now. We're being realigned, reframed, reformed, where we look like the book of the Acts of the Apostles. So when it says here in that day, the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. Not everybody's going to get this. Not the entire church is prepared for this. You have to understand how God works. God always has a remnant. He always has a residue. He always has a people that are sold out to him. Jesus had many followers, but only 12 disciples. 
there was real, it was real clear as to what he's requiring of those uh, who's that residue, that holy remnant, that radical remnant. So verse 6 says, and for a spirit of judgment to him who sits in judgment. People said things like, well, don't judge, don't judge. Uh, somebody better be judging something. Well, we can ascertain what is right and what is wrong. What is of God and what is not of God. We got to be real clear about that. So for those who sit in judgment, he gives them the spirit of judgment. And it says, and for strength for them who turn the battle at the gate. So there is warfare at the gate. There's warfare in the context of what's going on in our culture. The war of ideas, the clashing of the swords. And he's saying that he's going to give a spirit of judgment to those who sit in ju judgment. Really, it's a spirit of justice is what it is. The spirit of justice to those who sit in judgment. And we're into social justice. According to this passage, God is into the spirit of justice. Never get social justice and the spirit of justice confused. They're not the same. Let me see, well, what's the difference? Now, the spirit of judgment, the spirit of justice, rather, does have have, please hear this, it does have social implications, but it's not based on retaliating, protesting, marching, coming against, fighting for our rights, making a stand up. It's more geared towards righteousness, peace, mercy, truth, love, compassion. Those are the motivation, motivating forces behind the spirit of justice. So he gives that spirit of justice to those, it says here, who turn the battle at the gate. Gates in Bible days had some very weighty connotations. Gates denote the place of doing business, the place of where courts were held, the place where political framework was developed, the place where they, were, they did business and laws were passed. It carried some very deep connotations. Every city in America has gates. Our country has gates. Hell has gates. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church in the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Heaven has gates. When the Lord ascended upon high, and David got a glimpse of this in Psalm Vision 24, and he said, be lifted up, O ye everlasting doors, open up ye gates, and the king of glory shall come in. So heaven has gates. Gates denote authority. D gates denote accessibility. Gates denote what comes in and what goes out. So now we have to understand for every believer who's a part of a local church in a certain region, we're assigned to deal with the gates of that region, the gates of that city. And as we deal with the gates of the city, we determine what kind of spiritual activity comes in and what do we put out? What do we evict? What do we cause not to operate anymore? Um, because the church has understood that poverty has ran rampant. Murder has ran rampant. Family breakdown has ran rampant. Gun violence has ran rampant. Drug abuse has ran rampant. Sex trafficking has ran rampant. When we begin to move into this realm of understanding our true spiritual authority and do battle in the gates of our city. Why? This has had negative implications generationally. And now God is awakening the church to begin to ascend to the high place and to begin to execute the spirit of justice and to execute righteous judgment and to carry out the mandate, the will, the plan, and the purpose of God. You know, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter was preaching, he said, save yourselves from this perverse or perverted generation. I looked up in the Greek, that word perverse over there in Acts 240, it's the Greek word skolios. It's actually a medical term, and it means crooked or curved. It's the opposite of the word orthos, which means to straighten, and scolios means to be crooked. There are people that have a certain disease called scoliosis, the crookedness of the spine. They can't walk straight. Well, spiritually, that's what's happened in our culture. So when Peter preached that message on the day of Pentecost, repent. And that means get back on top. Something has brought you down. And then he talked about the, the generation and what's happened to the generation, the perversion in the generation. Save yourselves from this wicked and perverse generation. So this perversion in the generation. The only answer to perversion is conversion.
So we've got to be intentional in converting people who are caught in the framework of a culture that is laced with the spirit of the Antichrist, anti-God anti-Bible, anti-Jesus. Now, as we stand more and more for that, what we're going to find is more and more people are going to stand against that. Why? Because the kingdom is suffering violence. There's a clashing of the swords. So we have to be like the sons of Issachar were. They understood the times and they knew exactly what God's people ought to be doing. Word to God, we begin to move into a new anointing of the Issachar tribe and begin to understand what's really going on in our culture. Let me give you a little insight as to what is really going on. We have been seized by several isms like secularism, humanism, socialism, Marxism, and all the other isms that ought to be wasms, they have seized our culture to the extent that it's got a generation thinking like the world in great, great distress. And when people are in great, great distress, they respond a certain way. When the pressure is on, what's on the inside of them will come out. So when the squeeze is on, certain things, negative things begin to pop out. That's what's happening right now. You know, Isaiah 59, we looked at that last week, but there's a passage there, a verse there in Isaiah 59 that says, what you have is oppression and revolt. What is that really saying? Whenever a people are oppressed, they will cause a, a revolution. They will revolt. That's what's happening right now on the streets of America. It's beyond this pandemic. It's beyond the racial upheaval. It's been building for decades because we've been training young people to think a certain way. And that way they're thinking is not the biblical way. It's not the God way. It's not the spiritual way. It's the worldly, fleshly way. And whenever you have a people that have been oppressed for decades, centuries, and and in the case of black America, centuries, oppression, we came here as slaves. So that's been building up. And now it's come to a groundswell of explosion and revolting. And the question is, where's the church in all of this? The question is, where is God in all of this? God is looking to move. The way God moves oftentimes, it's in the middle of complete chaos. Everything is falling apart. Everything is going wrong. Nothing looks good. And all of a sudden, the hand of God begins to rise up. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's a move of God. We are being postured right now for the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit that the world has ever seen. And now he's raising up that remnant, that residue, who will turn the battle at the gate. In other words, we're not just going to our little church services anymore. We're dealing with what's happening in our region, what's going on in our city politically, economically, educationally, socially, culturally, and they begin to take the word of God, the authority, the power of the kingdom of God right there in the marketplace. In the past, we've not done that to the extent we should have. So now there's an awakening. Now the alarm is sounding. Now the church is starting to rise up. Even as Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1 says, arise and shine for the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. This is essential for us to understand right now. Why? Because of this war of ideas, because of this clashing of the swords, um, our generation, our culture has been on a downward spiral in morals, values, ideals. There, we've been depleted of values. Anything goes. Everyone does what's right in his own eyes, as it says in the book of Judges. That's what's happening right now in America. So God has got to intervene somehow. The church has been praying and crying out. And we're at a point now, we've got to keep on praying, but now we've got to do something. Now we have to be engaged. Now we have to let them see all this power, all this anointing, all this glory, all this Holy Ghost we say we have. Let's take it to the streets. Heretofore, we've been pouring water in the ocean, riding by the desert. Now let's make a divine turnaround. Let's go where people are depleted. People are thirsty. These young people that are even protesting in the streets of America, they're misplaced warriors. We have to discern who they really really are. We have not gotten to them yet. The, the harvest is ready. They're our harvest. The harvest is ripe. They're the ones that are ripe. The church somehow have pointed the finger at them, put them down. Why? They only like that because we have yet to reach them. 
They're only doing that because they have no other way. There's no other recourse. No one's given them truth. Once you get truth, it changes everything. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth that you know will make you free. So when we begin to release this freedom, this liberty, based on the truths of the kingdom of God, it breaks the chains that have people bound, bound in fear, bound in anger, bound in envy and jealousy, bound in self-pity, bound in hatred. Those, by the way, are the rulers of darkness. So we bring truth and the love of God. That is broken. And now it's an open slate for us to come in with his love, with his truth, to bring people into present day flow of what God is really saying. God so loved the world, not just the church, the world. God loves the people that are looting. God loves the people that are burning our streets, our, our stores in urban America. You're not going to like this next part. God loves the police that are killing black men in America. God loves them. I don't care what you think, what you feel. Truth does not need your endorsement. God loves them. So God loves all people. God loves the indigenous people. God loves terrorists. God loves everybody. So he's got to get a church that is so full of his love, so full of his word, so full of his anointing, that they will turn the bell at the gate and decide, we're not going to stand for this in our city. We're not going to let this happen. Not on our watch. We're going to go into the high place. That's what Jeremiah chapter 1 is only talking about. God told Jeremiah, I have put my words in your mouth. And I've set you over kingdoms and nations to tear down, to throw down, to pull down, to uproot. Then he said to build and to plant. So this has an end game. We ain't just about destroying the works of the wicked one. We want to build kingdom purpose. We want to release the love of God, the goodness of God, the favor of God, the blessing of God. We want to release the kingdom dimension in these cities that God's called us to. So to do that, we have to know what it means to turn the battle at the gate. This carries tremendous implications. When you understand that, that everything in our culture is going in the other direction of Christ. People are, people are turning their back on morals, values, not knowing what is right or what is wrong. They're defacing monuments in our country. They're coming against everything and everything that they feel like may have been a stronghold of racism and bigotry in our country. And they're not being very discerning as to how they go about doing that. So the church has got to lovingly, not judgmentally. When I say judgment, I mean judging mentally. We're supposed to judge what's right or wrong, but never get judging and judge, being judgmental confused. Being judgmental is when you mentally are condescending towards someone that you disagree with and you put them down mentally. I'm not talking about that. The judgment I'm talking about is a righteous judgment, a holy judgment. One that's decide not to put people down, but to lift them up. The church has got to come to a whole new dimension as to how we operate in judgment. Righteous judgment, holy judgment. Now, get a hold of this. I just got to mentioning that the, the different isms that we're engaged in right now, I didn't mention modernism and postmodernism. So what is happening right now, postmodernal thinking has taken over our country. What does that mean, though? Postmodernism basically says everything is relative. Truth is even relative. There are no absolutes, meaning what's truth for you may not be truth for me. It depends on your perspective. So if you need all this Jesus stuff, that's good for you. Go ahead. But I don't need that to make me saved, to make me feel good about me. I don't need that. If you need that, they call it religion. And we're not talking about religion, but that's what they say. So postmodernal thinking has no absolutes. Well, here's the truth. Unless they receive an absolute savior and become absolutely born again and absolutely come into the kingdom of God. They will be absolutely condemned and damned forever and ever. That's the Bible. Absolutely. Ain't no gray areas there. 
Once again, truth does not need anybody's endorsement. So we've got to bring people truth, truth that makes them free, truth that breaks the chains of the lies and lets them begin to see the love of a loving Heavenly Father like they've never known before. So now God is recalibrating the church even as to how we do evangelism. The reason it's so important, we are losing a generation. Generation Z, Generation X, the millennials, we're losing them because they've been inundated with ideologies of secularism, humanism, socialism. If they go to any college, university of higher learning, most of their professors are socialists. Forty-eight percent of all the professors in, in public education in America are socialists. So our children are sitting under that day after day week after week, month after month, year after year. By the time they graduate, they have a socialistic mentality. And they respond to things in the world based upon that, not the kingdom. So the church has not been preaching the kingdom. We've been preaching something else. And because we've been preaching something else, we've allowed ourselves to be diluted with the kingdom perspective. So now God's waking us up. Now the trumpet is blowing in Zion. Now there's a spiritual awakening. Now there's a rising up of the church to begin to advance the kingdom agenda. What does that mean? <clears throat> when you see the word kingdom in the Bible, it always denotes the rule, the reign, and the government of God. What we need is God's rule and God's reign and God's government in every sphere of our culture and society. Government education, economics, business, social structures, the culture at large, media, entertainment. We to usher in the weightiness of the king and his kingdom. There is no such thing as a king without a kingdom. So Jesus is the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. So this battle that we're talking about, then that verse in Isaiah talks about the Lord of hosts, which means the Lord of war, the Lord doing battle. And then he gives strength to those who turn the battle at the gate that determines what activity comes into our country, our city, our state, our region, our communities. The church has got to rise up in true spiritual understanding and true spiritual authority. Now, let me share some alarming stats with you. According to the Barna Research Group, they track biblical worldview perspectives uh, in the church and the culture at large. And what they've come up with, baby boomers have a biblical worldview of only 10%. Generation X has a biblical worldview of only 7%. Millennials have a biblical worldview of only 6%, and Generation Z have a, only have a biblical worldview of 4%. So what we have is, this is for Christians, not the world, not the people and the citizens in our country, just the so-called Christians. So the question is, what does it mean to really have a biblical worldview? Because there's a war of ideas, and these ideas are floating through the gates of our city, the gates of our regions, the gates of our educational systems. So what does it really mean to have a worldview based upon the Bible? Since most Christians don't have that, most believers uh, don't even know what that really, really means. Uh, a biblical worldview, really, when you really think about it, though, everybody has a worldview, whether it's biblical or not. Everybody has a worldview. Your worldview was evolved almost by osmosis from the time you were a child. The books you read, the values instilled into you by your family, um, movies you watched, um, music you listened to, and all these things formed a worldview that kind of formed and shaped and morphed your persona as to how you view things, how you see the world around you. We all have one. 
That's not inherently wrong unless it violates what thus says the Lord, unless it violates a biblical perspective. So in essence, it has violated that. So we have to have our minds renewed. That's why the Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's how you get a worldview based upon the Bible. It's called mind renewal. Now, when you have a worldview based upon the scriptures, you think a certain way. When you have a worldview based upon the scriptures, uh, you see everything around you from a biblical, kingdom, spiritual, godly ideology. It's not based upon being white in America, not being black in America. It only is based upon what thus says the Lord. I'm viewed as a black man. Really, I'm a Christian who happens to be black. My identity isn't rooted in being black in America. My identity is being is rooted in being a kingdom citizen who happens to live in America, who happens to be black. So I'm not minimizing my blackness. I'm not putting that down. I'm saying that's not where my identity is. When it's anywhere else other than the kingdom of God, I become a child of a lesser God. So we have a whole group of believers, Christians, who become children of a lesser God. Now, what does that mean? Talking about worldview, your Bible says Satan is the God of this world. So when you come and start thinking like the world, how they respond, how they think, how they function, then you are a victim. Hear this. God never called you to be a victim of anything. Well, they, they, they came against me because I'm black, it's racism. You're not a victim of it. You experienced it and you refuted it. That's how it's supposed to work. Trust me, I'll be 69 years old this year. I have been, a, been really on the other end of racism and I've never seen myself as a victim. I always see myself as a victor. This person, they don't know who I am. They don't discern me properly. They're not better than me. They're not superior to me. Once they find out who I am, it's going to change the game. I cannot tell you how many times that has worked. Why? I didn't get mad. I didn't get bitter. I got better. I, began, I came from a kingdom perspective, a higher level that's called love. Now, Please know, the Bible tells us we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. If I'm the victim all the time, mad all the time, against the system, against the white man, against what they did to us, uh, I will never be a proponent of reconciliation. I'm always fighting for my rights. Well, in the kingdom, I have authority. No one can give me my rights. I get them from what the Word of God says about me, not what legislators who don't even know God bills that they pass. I don't want them to do nothing. Just give me a level playing field and I'll get the job done myself. Give me a level. Let me have access to the pond. I don't need you to give me a fish. I will fish for myself. We've got to change the way we think. There has to be a paradigmic shift as to how we do everything we do in the kingdom of God. And what has happened is uh, we've adapted to worldly systems more than the kingdom. We've adapted to how people are doing and how they think and how they feel and not what thus says the Lord. So now... This pandemic, we have been recalibrated. We're coming out swinging. We're coming out with a new outlook, a new perspective, a new anointing. We're coming out with something totally different than we've ever had in days gone by. Now, this changes everything. There's a new anointing. There's a new way you're going to pray. There's a new way you're going to worship. There's a new way you're going to praise. Uh, I'm glad for what happened before, but now it's a dawning of a brand new day. There's a new anointing. Ha! Huh. There's a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit as we turn the battle at the game. Only the radical remnant can get this. Are you a part of that radical remnant? What does that mean? You have such a zeal for God. Nothing distracts you. Nothing hinders you. Nothing defines you but what thus says the Lord. You're not angry at the white man, the black man, any systems. You recognize what's really going on. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Let's go to the gates. Go to the gate of your city your community. 
pray and see God. Find out what kind of spiritual activity has been going on here. Spirit of suicide? Okay, your name. I command you to bow your knee to the name of Jesus. Spirit of racism? You are a name. I command you, bow your knee to the name of Jesus. Spirit of bigotry? You are a name. I command you to bow your knee to the name of Jesus. Spirit of witchcraft? You're a name. I command you to bow your knee to the name of Jesus. Spirit of murder, homicide, abortion, your names, I command you, bow your knee to the name of Jesus. We'll begin to operate in that level of authority and pray that, release that, decree that in the gates of our city. And we turn the battle at the gates. We shut down the spiritual activity of the wicked one. God said, this day, I have set you over the kingdoms and the nations. Tear them down, throw them down, pull them down, uproot them, and begin to build and to plant. That's Jeremiah chapter one. In verse 12, he says, I'll hasten my word to perform it. So we gotta make sure we're returning God's word back to him. Why? We understand the times and we know what we ought to be doing. I'm so glad you joined us this evening. Please come back next time. We got more to say about this. God bless.